<laughs> Hello, everyone. How's it going? Okay, come on, y'all. I need a little bit more energy. Come on. What? Can y'all hear me all right? Almost got nervous. Okay, great. How are y'all going? Thank you so much for coming out today in the rain. New York City in the rain is not pretty, so I really appreciate you all for coming out today. Um, my name is Saidin, and I'm part of the education team here at the People's Forum. How many people have been here before? Okay, all right. Oh, welcome home. Welcome home for everyone that's new. Welcome to the People's Forum, where political and education, political education and cultural space for folks who are organizing and struggling together for a better future. Um, with that, I'm really excited to welcome everyone here for this really great book, um, book talk on Afterlife, A Collective History of Loss and Redemption in Pandemic America. So 2020 was a really ground-shaking year for pretty much every single person between the rise of the pandemic and kind of the end of like life and business as usual mm -hmm. to the height of like mass racial uprisings, 2020 election, and that's honestly just the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole lot of stuff that went on that year, and it's even thinking about it, I get exhausted. So I'm really excited for this book to go through and of what that year looks like, how we navigated, endured, struggled, came out on the other end, and just, you know, opportunities that happened in that year. So I'm really honored to introduce the speakers today, Carrie Lee Merritt, Robert L. Sai, Yahoo Williams, and Raylan Barnes, the co-authors and editors of this really amazing book. So I'm going to start with Robert. Robert L. Sai is a professor of law and law alumni scholar at Boston University. He was born in Taiwan, but his family immigrated to the U.S. when he was a child. Today, he's a legal theorist and historical of constitutional ideas. Carrie Lee Merritt is a historian and writer based in Atlanta, Georgia. She's the author of the award-winning Mashless Men, Poor, White, and Slavery, Poor Whites and Slavery in the Antebellum South, as well as co-editor of Reconsidering Southern Labor History, Race, Class, and Power, and Afterlife, A Collective History of Loss and Redemption in Pandemic America. She's currently writing a new book, Resurrecting the Dream, Lillian Smith's Message to White America, and working on a new multi-episode Civil War documentary. Dr. Yuhuru Williams is a distinguished university chair and professor of history and founding director of the Racial Justice Initiative at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. He's the author, co-author, and editor of numerous books, including Teaching Beyond the Textbook, Six Investigative Strategies, and Call Him Jack, the story of Jackie Robinson, Black Freedom Fighter. And last but certainly not least, we have Raylan Barnes, who is an assistant professor of American history at Princeton University and a fellow at the Hutchins Center for African and African American History at Harvard University. She's a co-editor of Afterlife, a collective history of pandemic America, and the author of the forthcoming book, Darkology, When the American Dream Wore Blackface. So I'm really excited for this conversation. Thank you all so much for coming out today. Uh, there it is. That's the energy I wanted. Listen, thank you. Um, Thank you to the co-authors and editors for being here. Thank you to Haymarket, and thank you all so much. If you'd like to get this really amazing book, check out 1804 Books at the front. You could get it there. You might even get a little autograph. I can't promise anything, but yeah. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Raylan. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Uh, you managed to make it through the rain and all of the chaos going outside. Welcome to those who are joining us from home. Um, so before we begin, I just wanted to start with a moment of silence for those that we lost during the pandemic and also acknowledge that unfortunately we lost one of our co-editor, our co-authors um, in Afterlife, uh, Gwendolyn Midlow Hall, who recently passed. Um, she was an epic historian. I encourage you to read her work and also um, her obituary in the New York Times gives a pretty wonderful overview of her fantastic contributions. So we'll take a moment. All right, thank you. So we want to thank the People's Forum for generously hosting us. I believe this is, Kaylee, is this your third event here? So, yeah. yeah, so they're a wonderful partnership. Um, and we also, of course, want to thank Haymarket Books, um, our editor, Anthony. And I wanted to acknowledge a few people in the audience just because as a book historian, um, I'm all about acknowledging the sometimes up to 50 people who do or contribute to a book. Um, and so, Joseph, if you could stand up, he proofread, fact-checked, did all our footnotes, um, and it was pretty profound. <laughs> um, so he, he 
at least two of them were very, very seriously ill, and he stepped in to help us um, to make sure that everything was a-okay. And then also I wanted to acknowledge my dad, Larry Barnes, who did the cover. Oh. <laughs> um, he's an artist from Southern California, and maybe later I'll let him share the story, the very funny story of where the cover art came from. So my uh, co-editors just asked me to briefly share the origins of this project, and then we're going to get into it. They're going to do readings, we're going to do question and answers, and have a conversation all together. Um, so one of the interesting things about this book is it was put together without us ever physically being in the same place because of the pandemic and isolation. So the majority of this book was put together while on speakerphone and Zoom and Google Docs. And we had to teach some Google Docs to you <laughs> who was fighting it all away. Um, but this, this project really had digital origins. So um, during the lead up to the 2020 elections, I was just really struck as a historian by the ways in which mass death was um, a catalyst and sort of a moving force in the election in a way that we really haven't seen um, since the civil rights movement, but really especially since the civil war. So I was thinking about the ways in which Joe Biden, for example, ran as a promise kept to his son, Bo, made on his deathbed. Um, we were thinking about uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, the loss of John Lewis, and it just really felt like in those leading days up to the 2020 election when all of us had to take physical risks to go to the polls and fight for American democracy, that we weren't just fighting for ourselves um, or the soul of America, as both John Lewis and Joe Biden um, termed it, coined it, but also we were fulfilling the legacies, the life legacies of so many of these American heroes who fought to expand our rights and our citizenship and to protect them from being taken away from us. And so I was just really reflecting on what does that specter of mass death do to a society that is not, per, not very good at grieving or acknowledging death, but at the same time, um, we've lost a million Americans that we know of documented. So what does that do to a nation? So I sort of was just going off on Twitter one of the nights like a you know crazy buffoon during one of the um, televised debates. I kind of would go crazy every time the tele televised debates happen. And you heard, it was like, girl, don't be putting these ideas on Twitter. Like, that's a good idea. Take that down. You need to think about that. That's a book. And at first I thought he was joking, um, but we had some text message exchanges and DMs. And I said, well, we really need to talk to Carrie Lee because she's the one who's really great at pulling people together, these large scale projects. Um, both of them have a pretty um, amazing experience in bringing together a lot of people. And so the three of us got together and we brainstormed. And the last uh, other component of this that I will say before I hand it off to my co-authors is as a cultural historian, a lot of the primary sources that I use, but also um, uh, just art and literature that I love came out of the WPA or the Works Progress <laughs> Administration, which was when Roosevelt during the Great Depression and World War II put 8.5 million workers to work to not just create roads and work in the park service, but also funded the arts, funded theater, funded historians, funded writers, um, pretty much all of classic Americana of the mid 20th century is touched in some ways by the Works Progress Administration. And so when we were during lockdown and we were all isolated, I just kept going, why aren't we coming together and doing something? We need to be mass documenting what's happening. We need to be putting everyone who's pretty much at home, their creative power to work. And I kept waiting and waiting and waiting. And obviously, that was not something the Trump administration was interested in doing. And so, <laughs> I mean, to say the least. Um, and so I'm so happy that this volume exists because one thing that we hoped is that this would seed the beginning of an archive of primary sources and encourage others to write down their experiences, to think critically about what happened to them in the pandemic in the racial uprisings um, and just really critically reflect on this profound historical moment that we have survived. Quite literally, we are still alive and a million of our American um, countrymen and women are not. So um, last thing I wanted to say, we also decided that it was really important to stress diversity in this book. 
because we felt that a single authoritative voice could never capture the true experience of the pandemic. People experience the pandemic radically differently within the same household, but when you really zoom out and think about Navajo Nation, New York City, Los Angeles, rural Kansas, um, those experiences are profoundly different, class, race, gender, um, uh, sexual orientation, et cetera. And so we went out of our way to try and find as diverse voices as we could and come together, but the one request was, write about your experience through a larger historical lens or historical context. And we really gave people the freedom to take that and run and do what they want. So all that said, <laughs> I'm gonna ask a few questions of our um, co-authors and then they're gonna do readings for us and then we will open the floor for your questions as well. So we really wanna make this um, uh, a collaborative conversation because I know this is something that we've all been living with and thinking through. So I guess, so I've given my justification about why I felt this book was needed, but um, deciding to write a book while in a moment of staring down death and um, possibly the crumbling of our nation was an interesting choice. So I wanna hear why you guys felt that this book needed to exist and why you needed to write your pieces. So obviously we were all working on different projects at the time. And when we started having these conversations, we realized how important timing was and how quickly we needed to get this project done. Um, obviously, there's going to be a slew of books you know, on the pandemic, on the Trump years, but we wanted to get the history right. And more importantly than that, we wanted to do it beautifully. And all of the people that we chose here, you know, a lot of them were historians and legal scholars that we deeply admired, that we probably had some sort of friendship or relationship with, but we picked them primarily because they were beautiful writers. And we wanted to be able to give them the chance to do anything they wanted to creatively. Create creatively. Um, you know, oftentimes when you're writing, whether it's history or, or legal scholarship, it's very formulaic at times. And, and so we wanted to give these amazing award-winning writers, you know, Bancroft Prize winners, um, you know, all sorts of amazing award-winning writers, the ability- There's a couple of Pulitzer Prize Pulitzer winners Prize in there. Pulitzer Prize winners, <laughs> Guggenheim, uh, Genius Awards, you know, I mean, all of these people, just give them the freedom to do what they've been wanting to do and write about what they've been run, wanting to write, write about. And what we got was just amazing. What we got back uh, really showed you how everyone went through this pandemic in some sort of loss. And all of our losses are different, whether it's a marriage, a relationship, the loss of a loved one, the loss of a career and identity and education. But we all have gone through loss and pain. and. The fact that we are still sitting here two and a half years into it and we really haven't dealt with that loss. We haven't dealt with the grief and the depth of the, the immense loss in our nation of, of not only of lives, but of, of our way of life in many ways. Um, you know, that's going to cause major problems if we don't actually deal with the grief. I, I would agree. I, I think. Um... So much of our work is involved in mining primary sources. And I think about some of the, particularly as a, as a scholar of the civil rights movement, Robert Penn Warren, who speaks for the Negro 1963, Howard Zinn, new abolitionists, people who were at the time were writing about what they were experiencing in a very visceral way that makes those books both primary sources, but kind of firsthand accounts of what it was like on the ground as they were experiencing these momentous moments in our history. Um, Ray Lynn and I had actually done a professional development for New York City Public Schools, and I was reading from Warriors Don't Cry by Mel Melba Patilla Beals, the youngest of Little Rock Nine. And she has that wonderful piece where she says, you know, her mom tells her to keep a diary on the eve of Little Rock. And she says, you know, as I was thinking about and reflecting on everything that was happening on New Year's Eve 1958, I sat home writing a list of my New Year's resolutions. But in the beginning, she begins, and I thought to myself, is it that nobody cares or nobody knows what to do? That to me felt a lot like. 2020 is that nobody cares or nobody knows what to do. When Ray Lynn sent out that tweet and then we connected with Carrie Lee, it seemed like the right thing to do was to begin to document this and give people a space to process it, to think about it in a way that, like those WPA um, documents, we were both sharing uh, 
you know, our experiences. But at the same time, as historians writing that first draft of history, we often cede that work to journalists. And yet, everywhere you looked, you had historians being brought on to put this into context. And you had people using all kinds of hyperbole to describe this, unprecedented, and so on and so forth, only to have scholars come on and go, well, there was this thing called the Spanish flu. And yeah, well, there was this racial reckoning in 1865, and then again. And so it was interesting for us to be in a space where we could talk about those things in a way that, um, divorced from the hyperbole, you had an opportunity to really look at the history in the context of scholars who were both dealing with that loss and at the same time trying to make sense of this from a larger frame. I'm so glad that Robert was able to join us tonight because I think it was one of the first essays that we got back was somewhere um, USA. And I think you brilliantly you know, bought out everything that we were hoping to capture in this. It was like proof of concept and a real sense for exactly what we were aiming for. Well, thanks so much. Um, I'm incredibly grateful and honored to be part of the volume. And, um, for me, what brought me to the project was, uh, you know, professionally, I was doing a lot of things like um, giving talks about uh, the uh, use of political language and the uh, blaming of, of, uh, of China and talking about the pandemic. Um, I was um, writing uh, about democratic decline and a lot of my you know, sort of scholarship. Um, and so my mind was in these sort of structural places, but I was also kind of tired of it all, if it makes <laughs> any sense. Um, and the one thing I really wanted to finish was a book project, and then March 2020 hit, and then all the archives that I needed closed, so I had to cancel my trip. Um, and uh, all the interviews I was gonna do live couldn't be done anymore. And so professionally, I couldn't do that either. Uh, and then out of the blue, this email came along, and you guys have been talking about it for some time. And uh, one reason why I guess I got the piece done uh, more quickly was because um, I was ready to, to try something a little bit different. And so for me, um, this is a kind of writing I've not really ever done before. It's a little bit different. Um, there, there is history in my piece. Um, the, the citations are spare, but um, uh, it, it's all real. Um, I took the opportunity to, 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 to try to think about what we might call the afterlives of, of, of inequality in a sense, to try to connect our present moment to uh, forms of inequality and structures that I had grown up with um, that I, I presume could only be worsened uh, during the age of, of pandemics. Um, so I wrote about, um, as we'll see in a moment, um, growing up in a small town, what that's like, what the cleavages are in, in small town America. Um, I changed the names of the real people that I knew, um, whose struggles that um, I began to think more and more about during this period. Uh, so my brain, as a way of trying to escape the horrors of the present, went backward into my own life, uh, into the community in which I grew up. And so uh, in a way, that was my coping mechanism. So that's how I, that's how I came to the piece. Thank you so much. Go ahead. I will quickly say that, and I don't even think you know this, but we were able to sell the book to the press because we had your chapter first, and it was so beautifully, beautifully written that, I mean, immediate, immediate acceptance. So thank you very much for that. Saved us some work. I also think there was an interesting thing going on in 2020. Well, it started in 2020 on a larger scale, but I think all of us shared this already, which was a sense of duty as uh, legal scholars and historians, the ways in which history was being mobilized, uh, both for liberation and terror. And um, even just thinking about the uh, Confederate monuments. And so that's the other thing that I think all of us really cared about was getting accurate information out there uh, we're all very dedicated to working with K through 12. I see some of our friends here tonight. Um, and so that was sort of the other piece of it. All right, so I'm going to ask you just to sort of maybe, um, you can do this in whichever order you want, either open with your piece and then answer this or vice versa. But just, I would like for you to talk briefly about why you chose the topic that you chose out of anything that you could write in 2020. Um, and also how that shaped your, this might be a big question, but um, understanding of yourself and also your understanding of America and your place in it. All right, so Robert, can Ooh. you? Ooh, that's a big one. That's a big one. Uh, I'll, I'll give it a stab. Um, 
Uh, I, I mentioned before that, that this is a very different kind of writing that I've ever tried before. I mean, I don't think I'll be able to do it again. Um, I, I'm glad okay. I have a day job. Yeah. I don't have, I, I, you know, I'm not sure about this, but um, it, it's, it's, it's different. Um, it, it's, it's very narrative. I, I, uh, what I try to do is to try to um, bury uh, judgment within the, the language of the narrative and to take people through what I see and what I saw and the people that I knew, very briefly, of course, but um, a as a way of showing these cleavages in small town America, the, the, um, uh, the racial, the, the economic uh, differences um, that are there, but that, that, that every small town or every big town has dreams and myth-making processes that, um, that, that try to paper over these kinds of things. And, uh, took me some distance um, in, in years in a pandemic to really uh, reflect more deeply, uh, you know, on this. And so, you know, that's, that goes to why I, I wrote it the way I wrote it, um, as, as you'll see. Uh, we'll see how people react to it. It's, you know, it's not necessarily the way people uh, accept history always to be, to be written. Uh, with a very clear thesis up at the front. I don't have any clear answers in the piece. Um, uh, although, I mean, if you ask me after this event, you know, I might have some personal thoughts about politics and policies, but they're not in that piece. I purposefully like left them out of the piece uh, so that people can access it and kind of observe, you know, hopefully through my eyes what I what I saw. But you also have some. I, there's a, a neat part in that essay, Robert, where you talk about. Um, and I think it's one of the more powerful elements of what is a phenomenal piece about what it meant to be an American as you're being othered in that space as well. Do you mind speaking to some of that or kind of share? It, for, for us in particular, reading that in the midst of all the anti-Asian hate in particular was powerful. You're talking about the stage scene yes, or something else? Absolutely. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, it, it's true, there's so many things that you know one can potentially write about you know, if you live in a place long enough, um, but um, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that I got involved in as a kid was theater uh, after being painfully shy and re finally one day realizing I had to do something about it. So uh, I got into uh, theater first and student government later. So, but theater was the thing that really um, showed me that, you know, there's a different side of myself. I could, I could do things I didn't think I could do before. At the same time, uh, it revealed to me only years later that uh, I, I was willing to sort of put myself in positions and, 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 and do things for laughs in a way that maybe I, I, I shouldn't have. So for example, put on a fake Chinese accent, uh, something like this, or Asian accent, even though I speak decent English, um, uh, make it sound a lot worse just for a few cheap laughs. And so I, I in the piece, do um, uh, find a, a semi-magical way of reflecting on that. Uh, on that uh, experience and having more regret about it uh, many years later. Well, I think it would be wonderful if you could read a selection and then we will go down and Sure. Uh, share. Kick me if I go on too long. Um, read what you want. We're here. <laughs> two, two quick sections about the, about the town um, and then about, about one person uh, that I grew up with uh, whose name has been changed. Um, about the town. Uh, the story of the founding of our uh, adopted hometown seemed like a giant cosmic joke. A handful of eager white settlers raced ahead of the pack and built cabins along the water in the early 19th century, praying that the spot would become a major territorial seaport. If it did, and Congress converted the territory into a state, their improvements of the land would pay off handsomely. But things didn't quite work out that way. What the settlers underestimated were capitalism and inertia. As a result, the railroad tracks laid down at an overly plodding pace by Chinese migrants working alongside white laborers took too long to reach the tiny civilization founded among the Douglas firs and maple trees. The tracks headed to where rich people lived, and the town's inhabitants were assuredly not rich people. In 1857, the state legislature incorporated the Northern Pacific Railroad but raised zero capital. The more populous communities took the lead and built railway, uh, railways connecting themselves to other larger communities, mostly out of private resources. Every time the residents of Port Somewhere felt their hopes raised that the next round of construction would integrate their town with the rest of the world, 
whose aspirations would be dashed, those aspirations would be dashed by bankruptcy or plans torn up in a corporate boardroom somewhere. Economic investments by the townsfolk in anticipation of a boom coming would be lost each time. During this period of its history, as isolation became uh, imprinted upon the DNA of the place, the town died many times over. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, Lorraine, someone I grew up with. Then there was Lorraine who had been partying harder and longer than anyone else I knew. We'd catch her at reunions, wasted, slurring her speech as she struggled to remember people's names. Lorraine got married after high school and took over the house in which her mother had raised her. But relations became unbearable between husband and wife. Their split was ugly. The two fought over everything from the rundown Pontiac Grand Prix to the chainsaw. Compounding Lorraine's humiliation, a judge awarded her childhood home to her former husband as she was unable to pay the mortgage. Enraged as the day approached to turn over possession of her house, Lorraine set about making the place uninhabitable. She tore every door from its hinges. Lorraine got rid of all the appliances. She cut a giant hole in the wall of her bedroom to remove a beloved mural. And after ripping up the carpet, she smashed in three windows. For the coup de grace, she spray painted a giant penis on the bathroom wall in gold paint and left her husband a message. If this were you, cockroach. When the sheriff's deputies came to kick her out of her own house, she told them, this house is mine. I've lived in it all my life. Lorraine's revolt against her circumstances led to a conviction for third degree theft. She spent 10 days in jail and faced two years of probation. Worse, she was branded a domestic violence perpetrator had a no-contact order entered against her, and was forced to undergo counseling. Thank you so much. All right, would you real be able to share? And then I think some of these will be uh, in very clear dialogue once we're done. So my essay is deeply, deeply personal, and I actually was writing it after keeping my sons out of school for a full year sent them back to school. You know, this was right when I had had one vaccination. It was right before I was eligible get to, to get the second. The minute we send our kids back to school, of course, whole house gets COVID. Um, I was incredibly, incredibly sick uh, for weeks. And eventually it did turn into long COVID that lasted months. Um, and I wrote a lot of this while having COVID and yet I didn't want to write about having COVID. I wanted to tell this story that I told. It's something that I've been wanting to tell for years and years and years, but given the fact that it's a personal story and personally about my family, um, I haven't done that. And it was an incredibly scary thing for me to do. I still have a lot of anxiety about putting this out into the world, but I do it with the spirit that hopefully it helps people. I realized um, just by tweeting and social media how many people have lived through similar backgrounds. Um, and so I'll just read a little bit, but um, it's heavy. I'm not gonna read the heaviest parts, but it's heavy. By the time I was in kindergarten, my mother had fallen deep into her illness. Although she was never properly diagnosed, the closest a doctor came was treating her for bipolar depression and she consistently refused to take the medication anyway. After decades of research on the matter, my best guess is that she had borderline personality disorder, BPD. BPD is characterized by extreme mood swings and volatile relationships. Inappropriate, intense anger, abusive tendencies, and threats of suicide are common in people with, a, with this disorder. My world was volatile, neglectful, and horrifically emotionally abusive. I had the Sisyphean task of raising three younger sisters while keeping my constantly suicidal mother from following through on her threats to kill herself. I became an extension of my mother's own psyche. I existed as her protective bubble, shielding her from the outside world. I learned the hard way that I had to devote myself to fending off the smallest thing that might set her off, at least mitigating the blow as much as I possibly could. 
I became out of an acute need for, for survival, my mother's emotional sieve. I absorbed all of her wretched pain and the world, all the world's troubles, allowing the good to pour straight through me to her so quickly I never got a chance to enjoy it. I had so naively hoped and prayed that something good might possibly diffuse some of her constant, unprovoked anger. Looking back, I finally realized what an impossible task this was for a young child. At the time, though, there was no thinking. There was only surviving. And do you want to share with us how, why, why do you think that this became the story you needed to share in the pandemic? Because I know you think a lot about issues of death and despair, um, and how you feel that this is in a larger context in America. Um, yeah, so I, it's couched in terms of, I had three major losses in my life, literally right before the pandemic started. Um, and so it tells kind of a whole micro history of, of my own family that's you know rife with mental illness and um, you know addiction and poverty. But uh, it, it starts with the story of my, my great grandfather who killed himself during the Great Depression. And so it really gets into suicide and the fact that um, you know, deaths of despair in this country continue to rise. And personally, from my perspective, I thought that, you know, people would be in kind of a survival mode throughout the lockdown of the pandemic. But once everything kind of gets back to no normal, you know, that's when we're going to see people really not know how to deal with everything and process what's just happened, especially in a country where you feel gaslit by the government and mainstream media that this didn't happen. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very, very much about suicide. And I, I hope that uh, anyone that has had a background with this in their family, that you can find some hope in it and, and at least feel a sense of connection and know that you're not alone with this story. Thank you so much for sharing. And what you heard? Well, I, I, that's hard for me because that is my favorite essay in the volume. And I get emotional just hearing you talk about it, reading it. Um, been a long time since when, when you cry when you read something because it, it touches you in in a particular kind of way and that essay um, even hearing you read uh, read parts of it today just brings back the feeling that I had when you first shared it in September um, you know that this the section that these essays are in of the book is called reckoning and we think about reckoning with regard to 2020 as being about the racial reckoning or how Me Too kind of bled into the, you know, that moment or the pandemic. But there were a lot, there was a lot of personal reckoning that took place in spaces where Heather Ann Thompson talks about it in the, uh, her piece called The Permeability of Cells on people who are in prison during the, you know, the, the kind of invisible imprisoned. Um, and she talks about solitary, solitary confinement and how we would think about that differently in the midst of a pandemic. But we were all in some sense in solitary confinement. My, my partner lives in, um, Forest Hills and I lived in Minneapolis. And so I spent most of the pandemic in a form of solitary confinement. Um, and it gave us a lot of time to reflect on not just the things that were visible in terms of what was happening elsewhere, but internally. And those things that were um, kind of have a long history, kind of the long um, impact of deindustrialization and on a on somewhere USA, which is also my experience in terms of deindustrialization. And so I grew up at the Nexus where Sesame Street met black power in, you know, community centers where when those community centers died and the crack epi epidemic came in, in in the 1980s, we watched those neighborhoods die and I fled, hoping never to go back, never to revisit that despair in that way. And then George Floyd just brought it all home in a way that kind of reminded us of that. I wrote about, my piece is called Dreams of My Great Grandfather. And I wrote it because um, in the midst of this, uh, I was doing my family history, like everybody else, I kind of went back in and started to do that. And I had been asked by Canadian television to come on and provide uh, commentary on Al Sharpton's eulogy of George Floyd, June 4th, 2020 in Minneapolis. And Al Sharpton in that speech um, started talking about um, uh, uh, malfunctions of the criminal justice system. And he said, what happens to Floyd happens every day in this country to um, African Americans in education and health services in every area of American life. It's time for us to stand up in George's name and to say, get your knee off our neck. Well, I had used my family history folder to prop up my camera that day. And I looked down at my family history folder and it reminded me 
of the fact that my own grandfather had been the product of one of those malfunctions of the criminal justice system. He was um, shot and killed in the 1930s. His murderer got eight years. And then my uncle, who was left with the responsibility of caring for the family, was murdered by his brother-in-law, shot and killed by his brother-in-law. He refused to press charges because he was the only male that would be left to take care of the family. And then that brother-in-law was killed in a high-speed chase with police, where the two officers actually shot out their tire, the 1930s, disabled the vehicle. It careened into a truck carrying two white farmers. And at this point, th these were Virginia officers. The crash took place in North Carolina. And so the only reason that the officers were arrested and held accountable is because of the death of the two white farmers. But in order to do that, they had to prefer murder charges against the um, officers for the killing of these two black men. So this is Black Lives Matter in 1930, 1930s, um, Virginia, North Carolina. And I'm experiencing this and having questions about the loss of my own uh, great grandfather and how growing up, I mean, I should have said this in the very beginning, my, own, my father just passed away a couple of weeks ago. Um, and Robert mentioned, I, I have a book on Jackie Robinson coming out. I, I felt like my father was fighting the burdens of history by being present in the sense that my great grandfather wasn't there and even Jack's father wasn't there. And so Jack talked about the importance of, of fatherhood for that reason. When my father passed, um, and kind of going back on this and, and looking at all this, um, it, it made me wonder as a kid why when we were kids, there was an absence of males in my family. And we even made up a little jingle as kids to talk about our family history. And it was all told matrilineally, matrilineally because we didn't have these males there. So it was like Rose had grandma, grandma had Nana, Nana had my mom, and my mama had me. And we thought it was so cute. But years later, that kind of dawned on me that where were the men? Um, and so I kind of sum up um, that piece, and I'm going to read to you for, uh, for, from the very end of this. Um, you got to me, Carrie Lee. I'm sorry. You can't me um, now. <laughs> Predictably, some, uh, I, I kind of talk about the end of, of Dante right at the end of this, but I'm just going to pick up here. It's not only the increasingly more visible stories of those killed by police that should occupy our attention. We should also listen to the testimony of their survivors. In the aftermath of her father's death, George Floyd's seven-year-old daughter, Gianna, proclaimed, my daddy changed the world. For this to be true, we must go beyond the accountability and policing called for by Reverend Sharpton. It would mean dismantling a system of white supremacy and the violence that has upheld it. Police killings obscure the more insidious, debilitating death that comes from deliberate policies, practices, and procedures that feed unemployment and underemployment, foster housing and food insecurity, and fuel the social determinants of health. These things leave hardworking Americans at the end of life with no health care and no safety net. The testament to George Floyd's legacy won't be found solely in police reforms, but in Gianna Floyd's future and the future of her children and her children's children. For the most insidious wound of all may be the markers of racial injustice and violence left due to epigenetic harm, passed down from generation to generation, inscribed in the scores of nameless, faceless people, so many of them dismissed by society as drug dealers, rum runners, and petty criminals. But they were ultimately survivors of both the burdens of American history and centuries of racial injustice. Thank you so much. So as you can tell, one striking thing that happened when we gave historians and legal experts the freedom to write about whatever they wanted in the pandemic, almost everybody reflected on their family's history. Um, Kaylee, do you want to maybe share about Ralph Ellison? I think you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we thought that we would end up getting a Sorry, lot of Keith political... Ellison, my <laughs> literary. I, I'm Keith sure Ellison. he's grateful for the, the <laughs> um, So we thought a lot of people would be turning in political pieces, you know, or very historically driven pieces. And actually, the opposite was largely true. For the vast majority of people, they wrote intensely personal, uh, almost micro histories of their own families or their own experiences you know, honoring the lives of, of people they lost. And so I, I, one of my friends is Keith Ellison, who of course is the Attorney General of Minnesota who was prosecuting Derek Chauvin at the time, you know, years of his life involved in this case. Um, and so I just assumed he would be writing about you know, this and, and how legally important this case is. And instead he wrote an incredibly touching tribute to his mother who sadly passed in that first wave of COVID. Um, but, you know, talking about her growing up as a black woman in America and the challenges she faced with poverty um, and but, you know, despite all of that, raising her children in such a way 
that you know made him what he is, that made him the public servant that he is, that made him see the goodness in community and, and working for the public good. Um, and so, I, I mean, the, the, the kind of essays that we got back, again, so intensely personal, but they're still relatable and they still show you what's going on during these crucial, critical years of the early 2020s. Yeah, and I think the last thing I want to say structurally before we open up the, the conversation is, you know, I was someone who was here in New Jersey and New York um, commuting back and forth, and that really got the bulk of the news. I mean, if anyone here who is in this room who lived through that, you know, you, you understand why it did. Um, but in our research, we discovered very quickly that um, when you look at the per capita deaths, it was actually the Navajo Nation um, that far exceeded both New York and California. So we decided to recenter the narrative um, and begin with Navajo Nation and really talk about America's very long history of epidemics, pandemics, um, disease, and how that's been weaponized um, from the very moment of contact all the way up through what we're experiencing now. Um, I just want to give a, a little shout out briefly to, to a few of the other um, pieces, just so you can get a larger context. So uh, Monica Munez Martinez writes about um, uh, her experience as a historian and someone who's working for human rights at the border, um, her experience of being down at the border during 2020. Um, Mary Catherine Nagel, who's a Creek uh, legal scholar and um, playwright, writes about her experience, especially during Standing Rock. Um, and then we have this section that's really interesting where we, where we make these comparisons between the issues of mass death and white supremacy um, and the Civil War. And so uh, Stephen Berry writes about um, Confederates take the Capitol um, <laughs> as somebody who he uh, self-identified in the essay as a white dude of a certain age and how he experienced as a Civil War historian watching um, the Capitol being taken. Martha Hodes here uh, nearby at NYU wrote an amazing piece called Two Catastrophes in 10 Parallels, um, The Lincoln Assassination and COVID-19, which is a fabulous essay to teach with. Tara Hunter, my colleague, wrote about um, the new Negroes uh, service, <laughs> servants disease, where she talks about how when we look back to places like Atlanta in the 19th century, um, Black women were especially being targeted for as supposed carriers of tuberculosis and TB, and some of the ways in which she was describing her research into uh, frontline workers and what was happening in places like meatpacking industries. Um, and so, so I just wanted to give you a sense that beyond our personal stories, there, there's some of these are truly grounded in um, uh, very rich histories. And I also wanted to share uh, Robin D.G. Kelly. You can read his um, essay in The Nation right now. He writes about the process of trying to write an obituary for his very abusive father in the first wave of the pandemic um, and then being hospitalized for COVID-19 in the second wave in California and reckoning with his own mortality and his inability to forgive and um, let go of the the pain that his father had wrought on his life. Um, and then Mary Duziak today, um, her, her article and essay just went up uh, with LitHub. And she, one of the classic arguments in American history is called the numbers game, uh, whether or not we should um, look at the numbers and things like the Holocaust or uh, the slave trade, or if we should be prioritizing individual stories. And so what she does is she tells a story of her brother who died um, towards the beginning of the pandemic, but was someone who had struggled with addiction and um, um, uh, housing insecurity and wondering if he is among the COVID numbers or not. And what do statistics tell us about reality? How do we reckon with or deal with or ignore a number like a million people dead? So those are just some other glimpses into what's in the book. Um, I have one last question and then we can open it to the floor. But in our title, we talk about loss and redemption. So what is the redemption in this book? What is the redemption that you're looking forward to in America or feel uh, needs to happen? And um, especially if there are other essays that you learned from, um, I'd also like to hear about that. Thank you. <laughs> 
uh, happy to go. Oh. So uh, what, one of the, just rereading the essays, one of the things that occurred to me that, that was a strong theme, most visibly shown in your essay, in the, in the great road trip, um, but also I think a theme that was in all of our essays was this notion of, of movement, right? That we were obviously all stuck somewhere, our minds were stuck, our careers were stuck, our um, projects were stuck, and our minds were wandering in various ways. Um, and um, some people physically left um, and found ways to do that. Uh, others just, you know, did it by writing in a different way. Um, there was the flight from family. Um, and um, I just wonder about the themes of flight and survival uh, and uh, reinvention as, as well as, as something that is connected to the, the flight uh, as, a, as a, a potentially constructive aspect to that. But uh, I'm curious to know what you guys say. Um, so we actually write a lot more than about than just about the pandemic here. We write extensively about Trump and what we call the first three Wednesdays in January uh, with insurrection and impeachment trial. And uh, Yuhuru actually wrote an incredible essay on Black Lives Matter and the protests through the early 2020s. And I would say that if I'm holding on to hope right now, it is through the young people. And I think that one thing that we have kind of overlooked in these Black Lives Matter protests is the number of young white people who actually got involved for the first time, who actually put their lives on the line, got out in a pandemic, went out and protested. And we, this is unprecedented numbers of young white people. And so that to me is very hopeful. I also see these little pockets of labor power that are popping up all over the country. And of course, they're far between and few, and there's a long you know, struggle ahead. But just to see these little pockets of labor success all around the country, I, I really think the labor movement is obviously one of the main ways to create coalitions and uh, you know, push for any kind of progressive reforms. So, no, I would agree. Um, the book is much more than the pandemic. In fact, Peniel Joseph talks about the need for a third reconstruction. It was interesting before his book came out, um, I think he was workshopping a lot of that, those ideas with us, mm -hmm. and they are reflected in the essay that he published with us in Afterlife. Um, I love what you said, Robert, because I think there are those themes of, of movement, but then at, at the same time, um, one of the great things about this collection is that you get someone like uh, Jacqueline Dowd Hall talking about the grief before the grief. This idea that the way in which the pandemic or being isolated or the racial reckoning or Trump, Trumpism exposed issues that we were already dealing with, that we were already frustrated about, that in some sense, um, this became a conduit for us not to be able to avoid it. It was almost as if what happened to George Floyd in May of 2020 is magnified by the fact that the reason that people can't turn away for the first time is we're all sheltering in place and CNN is running the death numbers for COVID. And then suddenly you can't turn off the, because everywhere you turn, it's COVID and then it's George Floyd and no one could turn away. Um, in some sense, one of the things that's so great about Jacqueline Dowd Hall's piece, one, one of the things that's so great about Carrie Lee's piece is what happens when you can't turn away? Um, John Lewis, I think, offered the greatest piece of hope for us um, in his final letter to the American people, which is published posthumously in the New York Times uh, in, a few days after his death, where he says, together we can redeem the soul of America. And he articulates what I like to call the Lewis Doctrine. These four tenets that begin with the idea that um, you know, ordinary people with extraordinary vision can redeem the soul of America. I love that because I think that we gave people a space to talk about um, the ordinary being extraordinary in that and coming out of this traumatic experience that we've all had. How are we more sensitive in the ways that Heather Thompson talks about, not just to the kind of invisible voices of people who are suffering in prisons, but how do we show up differently? Before we came in today, there was a group here meet, uh, meeting talking about homeless or housing insecurity and free to pee. Um, we should all be more sensitive, I think, post-pandemic to the, some of those things that we took for granted in a more present, present and pressing way. Um, Lewis said that, you know, we have to study the past in order to understand that we are part of a long-standing struggle. So none of these things are new, but how can we think differently, reimagine the way that we show up and engage? Um, and he said we have to develop a global perspective. I think that that's really important as I think about Iran right now, what's happening with um, the struggles of women um, in that context. 
And I always tell the story of what happened during the pandemic. Um, I was on Australian Good Morning America of all things, and they called and said, can you come on? And um, put the context, the death of George Floyd in the context. And I said, sure, not knowing that Australian television is a lot earlier than the US, but so I agreed and so I'm on. And you know, I, I give this interview and it's over and immediately my social media is overrun by indigenous activists who are saying, thank you for coming on and putting uh, the context of the murder of George Floyd and what's happening in the United States into a, a larger frame for us. But we need you to understand it was one activist in particular on LinkedIn, young woman who wrote and said, look, our struggle is your struggle. In fact, um, we had an indigenous person die in police custody on Christmas Day. His last words were, I can't breathe. We appreciate what's happening there, but we need people to understand that they're doing a little bit of transference here and saying that this is the American problem, but this is global anti-black racism. This is white supremacy, large writ. So if you ever get a chance to come back on Australian television, if you could mention, you know, find a, so they called after the Chauvin verdict came in and I was about two and a half seconds into the interview and I said, well, and you know, um, 435 indigenous people have died in police custody in Australia since 1992, the most recent being as well. So look, I'll never be back on Australian television, but it's this idea of building this collective identification with global issues that we can tackle collectively that I think um, gives me hope. All right. So I just want to read one quote um, that sort of encapsulates what we try to achieve with the book, and then we are going to open up for question and answers with you. So we wrote that the goal of this book was try to understand America in a moment that seemed at once to be both rapidly descending into something long feared and simultaneously to be rebirthing into something wondrous at all costs. So now we would like to invite you to uh, ask questions of our authors, and hopefully we can do our best to answer them. Mike for you. <laughs> thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I really enjoyed hearing you guys just read your parts of your uh, of your sections in the book, and I think I'm definitely gonna uh, get get one of the books after this. And I guess I don't like. I, I feel like the way this is gonna come out is gonna be like a tangent, and like it won't. I don't even know if I can put it into like a succinct question. But like me as a young person. Um, and I was a, a like junior when the a junior in high school when the pandemic first started, um, and and then like these past few years, I feel like there's just been so much that's gone on in the country, and like I guess like even now, sometimes I feel really um, like a sense of bleakness for the future, and I like I feel like I have even this like this this deep fear of the future almost, and like just thinking about everything that is so wrong in the world and like um, like how are we gonna fix things? I'm just, I guess, like one of my questions is, do you feel like this moment in, um, in time in America, does it feel distinctly different from like, from, from any time before? Or like, you know, how people say like history repeats itself. Does this, yeah, I guess like, do you think we, we have failed to learn from parts of our history, and that's why we see like problems persisting so much into the present day. Um, and yeah, just like how do you think this moment fits into like the broader historical narrative? I guess that's an excellent question. Thank you. I love that question. That is exactly why we're writing this book because you're you're right. This is a an absolute you know, once in a lifetime moment right and and it can go either way right we can we can not punish the leaders of the revolt the rebellion the insurrection we can let them go free and build up their base and come back into power uh, we cannot do anything about white supremacy about anti-woman stance in this country or it's you can also look at it as here's this moment of great possibility and change right a moment that comes once in a lifetime for most people and um, I think it's hard for younger generations to think outside of governmental solutions. 
But when you go back and talk to all of these people that have worked in the civil rights movement, you know, many of them still alive today, and you go back and actually talk to them, they don't have faith in government, a lot of them, right? They figured out ways to create community and to create uh, aid societies and to create things that are beneficial for their, their families and their loved ones outside of the government. And I think that unfortunately, that's gonna be the path that a lot of us are gonna have to depend on. And I don't, don't, uh, don't take that as don't, you know, keep keep pushing the government. Obviously, get out there, protest. Um, I'm not just going to say vote, but push the damn government. But you also have to, you know, raise your fist, but also raise your children. You know, it's, it's bigger than than this. I add very quickly because I I love that question um, for the same reasons, and I can't improve on Carrie Lee's answer. What I would add is. Um, the fourth thing that I left out of by John Lewis is that fourth tenet is struggle is constant and inevitable. And ironically, we have kind of a sitcom understanding of our history where we think that things are kind of solved with March on Washington solved or the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But the lessons from this book, um, Stephen Hahn is here, the lessons from um, you know, earlier periods is that we have to constantly show up and reclaim that space over and over again. That this really is the struggle, is never to assume that that moment has passed. Ray Lynn and um, Carrie Lee wrote about this uh, in the Confederate Monuments, even, even before we were even talking about afterlife, that we contest for the public square every day. Um, we contest for, for, you know, I remember uh, some students saying to me, I can't believe this was, you know, a couple of years ago, Martin Luther King marched at the Klein Memorial in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and we're still fighting this. And I said, well, the fact that Martin Luther King marched here doesn't mean that that was the end of it. It means that we've got to show up in that space every day and reclaim that space. I think that's incredibly hopeful and empowering that our moments, um, and you heard this, people talk a lot about this in, in the context of the reckoning. We talk about movements, not moments. And we all have our moments in the way that um, Carrie Lee talked about it. And then we, and someone said this beautifully in the earlier section, session that Robert and I got a chance to sit in and talk about homeless insecurity. You plant the seed, you may not get to water it, and you may not get to see it grow, but you plant it. Or when you come in, you water it, or you, you're the caretaker. But all of us have that responsibility. We have to rec recognize the ways in which we're helping to, to create that, that change through taking part in an active way in all the ways that Carrie Lee talked about. Such a great question. I would also say, um, so I work a lot with people who were Rosie the Riveters in World War II um, and also civil rights uh, movement mothers. And what they always say to me when I start going down this vibe is look around the room. Like this book, the people who are in this book together, us working together, the people here, this would not have happened 50 years ago, 60 years ago. The, the fact that we can have the positions that we do, have the space to be here, to be safe here, um, and having this conversation is proof that all of those struggles inch us forward, inch us forward. And so um, uh, thinking about your, your upcoming book, it's like know the brick that you're putting into the wall, you know? It's, it's coming, and I think we are also, I, I don't like the whole, <laughs> we're the dream of the ancestors, but I mean, when we think about someone like John Lewis, um, you know, it's living proof that within one lifetime, America can make incredible strides. And we, have to, we also have to think about the incredible pushback we're seeing, it's for a reason, right? It's not in a vacuum. Um, and so, you know, keep up the fight and have hope. So I'm reminded of um, something James Baldwin wrote, um, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said something, he wrote something like, um, we must strive to, um, we must strive to uh, be both tough and philosophical concerning destruction and death. We have to see the world as, as tough as it is, which you clearly do. Uh, but one of the, the great things about learning history and reading history and, and meeting people from the past, as others appear, have been talking about, is we remember how much harder it was uh, it, it, during past struggles and that there is progress, even though it feels like history is merely repeating itself. There are patterns that repeat themselves, but there's also progress that's made. Um, I'm working on this book, I sort of alluded to it, but 
Uh, it's about a guy who uh, was a lawyer for the poor uh, his whole career. Um, and he uh, was uh, in the Deep South uh, right at the beginning of what we might call the, the, the early decades of mass incarceration. But in particular, he wound up being an uh, anti-death penalty lawyer right at the time when the Supreme Court um, allowed the death penalty to be restarted uh, in, the, in, the, in the 1970s. Uh, and, and at this time, you're talking about hundreds of people winding up on death row in a hurry. And he talks about uh, getting his for agreeing to take his first case, and he thinks there's going to be a truck that will pull up with all the documents, and it, uh, a thin file comes because he was sentenced to death uh, uh, after a couple hours in a trial uh, and a quick death sentence. And this is, you know, we're talking about the 1970s. We're not talking about 1930s, you know. So, um, and this guy and others are like this, um, somehow find a way to maintain their sense of the possible, the optimism, even as they see just this massive train coming down, you know, down the tracks at them and finds ways to, uh, to, to do things that, um, uh, to, to save lives uh, and push the law in a positive direction. So, um, so that's what I would say. Uh, there, you know, uh, reading history, learning history um, allows us to see those spaces uh, where progress can be made and how to do it. So. Thank you. Thank Any you. other questions? All right, I won't be the mean professor and call on some of you who are <laughs> smiling, who clearly do have some questions. Don't be shy. <laughs> um, but I want to sincerely thank everyone who came out tonight. I realize it's always hard to make it out in the rain, um, but we are here to answer questions. Um, those of you who are students who are joining us, please feel free, come up and talk to us. We're here to be your resource, teachers. Um, we want to talk with you and work with you. So thank you so much for coming out and get, get home safely. Thank you. Thank you.